had been in the years before the Great War, Big Mountain, the Big Empty, became home to one of the brightest minds of the 23rd century. The courier watched over the Big Empty for years to come, caring for it and keeping its discoveries safe until they were needed to help others. Which had always been Big Mountain's purpose. Past the laboratories and science, it had always been intended as a place to build the future of all mankind. The SYNC Central Intelligence Unit was impressed by the amount of exploration the courier had undertaken. Facilities believed lost, destroyed, or ones that had simply gotten up and walked to new locations had been rediscovered by its intrepid new master. Internally, the artificial personality debated as to whether it preferred the old management to the new and concluded that the courier's thorough approach to research and investigation was admirable and worthy of its respect. Dr. Mobius continued his research undisturbed in the Forbidden Zone. As much as he had attempted to create better scorpions, he tried the same with humanity, with considerably less success. These failures didn't bother him over much. Once the rush of Mentats wore off, he forgot he had failed in any event. After all, the bright young mind who had come to visit him in the Forbidden Zone had already exceeded his expectations. The sink atop the dome bustled with the voices of a small town, constantly chirping, arguing, and snarling at each other. Still, this all happened productively in the interests of its new owner. The SYNC Central Intelligence Unit discovered, despite its inversion code, it was comforted by the sense of community the other personalities gave it. The biological research station, obsessed with seeding everything in sight, requested a transfer to the X-22 Botanical Garden, so that it might, in its own words, sensually fertilize the garden's smooth contours. The garden sent back a polite refusal, saying it had prior commitments with a vault it had helped infect before the war. The bookshoot continued to devour all seditious materials until it nearly choked on a paperclip. It adamantly maintained it was a Chinese paperclip, and the whole thing had been an elaborately orchestrated assassination attempt. Whatever the reason, it slowed down for a while, carefully appraising each document and clipboard that came to it. The light switches continued to bicker and flicker. This persisted until the day someone dropped a flashlight in the sink, and the two of them united in their hatred of the showboat. One of them eventually transferred to the Lightwave Dynamics plant and began a long, unrequited affair with one of the holograms. The scene continued to ruthlessly scrub any particulate matter that came near it. Eventually, it gained access to the Magneto Hydraulics plant and nearly flooded all the big empty in an attempt to scrub the crater clean. Once it learned of the innovative toxins plant, however, it gained new purpose. It sought to develop antitoxins to flush into its drains and counteract the poisons bleeding into the soil. The toaster continued its psychotic spree, reducing all appliances in range to scrap electronics and spare parts. After one of its more psychotic episodes, however, the other sync personalities decided enough was enough and dumped the toaster in a bathtub. Sparking and hissing, the toaster swore its enemies would rue the day when they had bread and no way to toast it. Muggy did his best collect coffee cups, although in his quest, he accidentally trapped himself in Higgs Village. It might have been the end for poor Muggy, except he found it peaceful there, tidying up the kitchens of the think tank professors back when they had been flesh and bone. Well, except for Dr. O, who was an asshole having created Muggy in the first place. Muggy left O's house deliberately dirty 
punishing the dishes and cups that live there in blind revenge for serving Dr. O. Blind Owl Jefferson, with sounds the courier brought him, created a symphonic counter-frequency that saved Big Mountain from Sonic Invasion in 2019. If you didn't hear about it, good. It was rumored by the other personalities that he had a brief fling with the light switches. Although he forgot their names once too often and was soon left in the dark as punishment. Autodoc, always gentle and methodical, kept sewing up the courier in all the right places when the skin split open from repeated wear and tear. The Autodoc was just glad to have purpose again. It heard its simpler brothers and sisters who got shipped to the Sierra Madre were bored out of their skulls in that toxic dead city. In time, the Autodoc found a way to deactivate the Y-17 trauma harnesses releasing the corpses they had held prisoner for almost 200 years. As the courier ran through the X-8 facility multiple times, the computers analyzed the test subject's movements. Rather than performing a superficial observation, they realized the subject barely knew what communism was, or even what a high school was. This confused them for a time until the facility finally realized that its research had succeeded. So it let its cyber dogs out into the wastes to help protect small communities from physical aggression rather than communist propaganda. The infiltration program in X-13 felt spent, having repeatedly upgraded the stealth suit until it could upgrade it no more. It felt warm fulfilled, and a bit sluggish. It realized not long after, the stealth suit had left it, without so much as a note on the nightstand. So the infiltration program sent out robo-brains into the wastes, looking for its wayward technology. It eventually found Repcon HQ, and set up a new research center, testing and murdering fiends who kept breaking into the facility. <coughs> The courier, organs intact, continued onwards, a little less heavy of step, but with all the organs in the right places, as they should be. After all, brains can develop a life of their own when left to their own thoughts, and the courier's brain was more clever than most. Dr. Klein and the think tank remained alive, unaware of the world outside. They looped through their daily routine none the wiser about the world beyond, although perhaps wiser was the wrong word. The world outside belonged to the courier, and if anyone would shape it, well, the courier had already called dibs. There is an expression in the wasteland, old world blues. It refers to those so obsessed with the past they can't see the present, much less the future for what it is. They stare into the what was, eyes like pilot lights, guttering and spent, as the realities of their world continue on around them. Science is a long, steady progression into the future. What may seem a sudden event often isn't felt for years, even centuries to come. In the times following the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, however, Old World Blues took on a new meaning. Where once it was viewed as a form of sadness, nostalgia, it became an expression describing the potential for the future. It can be easy to see science as evil, technology unchecked as the source of all ills, all misfortunes. With the courier at the helm, science became a beacon for the future. There was Old World Blues, 
and new world hope. And hope ruled the day at Big Mountain. We could say more, but the stories in the Big Empty speak for themselves. Now armed with the transportal ponder, the courier could return to the dome at any time and crack open the secrets of the Big Empty one by one. The sink sat vigilant, waiting for its master to return, shoes covered in Mojave dust. Only one road yet remained, and it was one the courier had to walk alone.